while we're waiting, um, I wanted to um, give you a quick overview of the, 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 the program. Um, I will introduce our speakers and um, executive director of the MIT Sensible City Lab. They will speak about 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we will be opening up. Um, you're currently all on mute other than the hosts and the presenters. And uh, we will then be opening up um, you know, for questions. And we will request that you raise your hand and we will unmute you. And if you can just give your name and a succinct question, um, we would be uh, very appreciative of that. So thank you so much. I see we're um, getting more and more people. Thank you. So I think that I'd like to just get started as um, everyone is being admitted. Alan, thank you so much. So hello everyone and welcome to our very first round table discussion at the MIT CIO Symposium um, in the international booth. And this is intended to be a round table aligned with the weekly theme of the future of work. And it, it really is my distinct pleasure to welcome two uh, scientists, principal research scientists at the MIT Sensible City Lab, uh, Paul, uh, Fabio Duarte and Paola Santi. They are, um, doing extraordinary work at the MIT Sensible City Lab. And of course, we have uh, the executive director, Jackie Dufault of the uh, Sensible City Lab. And she will be ready and willing and able to answer any questions that you may have. So I will turn this right over. And I believe, Paolo, you will be giving the intro to the lab and then Fabio. Paolo, go ahead. I think you're on mute. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chitra. No I'm, uh, thank you. I'm sharing uh, my screen. I have a few slides for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, I will uh, quickly navigate to, uh, you to Sensible City Lab, a little bit of a short intro on the lab. Yeah. So if we were on campus, uh, our lab would, uh, is still there. I mean, now it's mostly empty, but is uh, very close to the main entrance of MIT on uh, 77 Mass Ave, quite close to the big and the small dome that you can see. There, we are hosted in the Department of Urban Studying and Planning. And this slide is always something that we show at the beginning of our presentation to motivate the work that we do. Uh, this slide gives some numbers uh, related to cities. Uh, the first number, two, refer to the amount of world of Earth surface that is occupied by 2%. On the other hand, the second number, 50, tell us that more than 50% of the population today lives in city. Actually, this number was crossed in 2011, and now we are beyond that number. And 75 is instead the percentage of world energy that is consumed in city. So it's quite impressive that only 2% of the surface of the earth consumes 75%. What is even more impressive is the next number, which is 80 which is the world total global emissions of CO2 that are generated by city. And that's another big number. So uh, you, you understand quite well that if you aim at solving some of the big problems that we have as you know, people living in the world, cities are a good place to start. And you know, cities are becoming more and more uh, characterized by two different layers. The first layer is the one that you see in the bottom of the figure. Uh, which is the physical uh, layout of the city, something that have been there since millennia now. Uh, and, you know, it's composed by the roads, the buildings, the sidewalks, the benches, and everything that compose a city. On the other hand, especially in the last 10, 15 years, more and more, we have also been producing a lot of data that we can see as a sort of digital blanket that covers the city. 
And this data has been, uh, you know, produced by whatever device we have, either on our self, like the smartphone, or in our cars, or in the building itself, in the built environment. And there is a huge amount of data that's been generated. And how can we use this data basically to connect the physical and the digital layer of the city for the advantage of the people who lives there? So the citizens and more in general, the human in the humanity who inhabit the world is at the core of the mission of the lab. So this picture is just a, a snapshot of a correlate of you know a mapping of people to projects at the lab that was taken a couple of years, almost three years back now, but just to show how interconnected we are. We have several projects and every people works on different projects. And another distinguishing feature is that we really come from diverse background. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, Fabio is more on urban planning and architecture. And you know we have people working in physics, in physics engineering, design and so on and so forth and you know the kind of portfolio of projects that we do really vary from a projects more related to building stuff as you can see here the very first prototypes of robots uh, that fabio will uh, describe later on and also doing experiments like you see on the top left where we you know put down some equipment to check vibrations on some bridges to you know, all type of different projects, also more related to data analysis, as uh, you will see myself. You know, we really like also to work uh, close to real world applications, and this for a number of reasons. You know, first, our research is almost entirely funded by our sponsors or other you know funding programs. So it's a good way of staying connected with the real world, understanding what are the real problems and what we can do to, to solve them. And we also like a lot to engage with the general public. Uh, this is an example of an exhibition that we did uh, a few years back in the National Museum in Singapore. But our work has been exhibited at museums worldwide, including the Venice uh, Biennale of Architecture, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and so on and so forth. And I want to now quickly touch on a couple of projects, more specific projects related uh, to the use of data uh, some of the data that I've said are being collected more and more in city for you know, trying to understand how to redesign or improve one of the many systems that compose a city that of course are related to the organization of work, especially you know, now in the life after. By working more from home. And generally speaking, we know that traffic is a very big uh, problems, uh, mm -hmm. problem in city, right? On the other hand, and we have experienced this very well during this pandemic, we do wanna go and meet each other. So we are not designed to stay shut, closed in our house forever, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that very well, especially now. So we don't wanna constrain the, the ability of people to move. On the other hand, we know that movement, if not well designed, so to speak, or well organized, can create a lot of traffic and a lot of problems, pollution, and you know, noise pollution, environmental pollution. So this is something that we would like to avoid. So as I said, most of the work that we do start uh, from data. And uh, you know, in this particular case, we look at data generated by these uh, nice yellow cars here, which are taxis. They've been equipped with GPS since several years, and GPS record the trajectory of the taxi, uh, the trip that they do, picking up and dropping off passengers. And that is a very big opportunity to understand how they are currently doing in terms of serving the customer and whether we can do something better. And you know, the current situation is that the taxi take and drop off a passenger and then just mostly randomly look for the new passenger driving around. And believe it or not, this part of randomly looking for a new passenger takes most of the time of a taxi. So about 60% of the travel distance uh, by a taxi is without any passenger on board. And that's very bad because it just contributes to pollution and traffic without really serving any of the customer they were supposed to serve. So can we do better with a system that is coordinated centrally and you know, try to send the vehicles right where they are needed? And that's basically was the idea. And you know, we, we, with this study that we call 
minimum fleet because you know the idea was if we know where people wants to go when they want to start when they want to go uh, can we understand which is the best way of serving them with the minimum number of vehicles because that would reduce traffic as much as possible and you know solving this problem generally speaking is very complex also because we want to do something that could be executed in real time and be used in an actual uh, taxi fleet and when you look at taxis, for instance, this analysis was done in the city of New York, you have half a million of taxi trip requests per day that should be served by today about 13,000 vehicles. And so the number of possibility is really, really big. And if you have to take decision in real time, you need a very fast solution. And this fast solution so far was uh, missing. And this is what we actually provided and, uh, you know, uh, proposed in the, in, in, the, in the research community using the idea of trying to use network science to solve the problem instead of different mathematical uh, optimization approaches that were proposed before. The idea is basically to express the fact whether two trips can be served by the same vehicle or not as relationship in a network and find the best way of serving them. Of course, I don't have time to go through the details, but you know, this uh, approach called uh, minimum fleet has been very, uh, well received in the research community and not only. And you know, the result is, is well represented by this plot. Uh, you see the, blue, uh, the, uh, the black curve is actually something computed by the city of New York and is the number of taxis in the streets of, of New York uh, in a typical week, okay? Data computed over one year of data. And is a number that is varying, of course, less in the night and higher in peak times, but is around 8,000 taxis. With our approach, uh, serving the same number of customers without any delay, we can reduce that number to about uh, less than 5,000, which is more or less a 40% reduction. And this is just an improvement of the system. Instead of random searching, uh, optimize uh, coordination of the taxi fleet to best serve the customers. And another example of use of data that is related to mobility, but also to the social aspect of mobility, they're trying to understand whether there are some patterns is related to the use of another uh, well-known uh, source of data that is becoming more and more important in these days There are social networks. And in this particular project, we look at tweets. Uh, and in particular, one type of tweets that are called geolocated in which, you know, not only the content of the tweet, but also the coordinate, the, the GPS coordinates of where the tweet was uh, generated. And uh, that was a project that together with the city of Stockholm. So we, of course, focused on the city of Stockholm. This is just a map showing the tweets that has been generated in the city in a more or less a couple of years, about 300,000. And here you can see just a density plot. There's no, no big deal. but. What it becomes more interesting is when you try to understand whether we can use tweets to understand how people experience the city. So if you look at the trace, so the number of consecutive tweets from a single person, you can understand what are the places with person and try to understand whether you see recurrent uh, patterns of people visiting the same pair of places for some reason. Okay, and then tell us story, what kind of story this can tell us. For instance, stories about how well the city is segregated or let's say be better socially integrated or not. Uh, we did this by looking at socioeconomic characteristics of different areas in the city of Stockholm. You can think of those area more or less as census uh, tracts using US terminology. And we looked at information about the average income, the average education level, and the average percentage of immigrants in these different uh, parts of the city. And we related that to how well or bad two uh, areas of the city were connected as uh, you know, resulting from tweets. In particular, the idea was to understand whether if we observe a relatively high number of uh, movements between two areas of the city, whether this is due to the fact that this, the two cities areas are more similar, for instance, because they have a similar immigrant makeup or a similar income level or a similar level of education. Do this effect of, you know, what is called in a social and 
in social science, homophily, uh, whether there is an effect on homophily. And we actually were able to show that there exists a pretty strong effect of this homophily. So we're trying to move, we tend to move in a similar way if we have similar social economic uh, features. And we, we, you know, we presented this result in a, with a scientific publication, but we also produce a nice visualization tool that if you want, you can access through our website as uh, senseable.mit.edu in which you can explore these connections of different areas of the city across the three dimensions that I just uh, mentioned, income, education, and foreign background to see the correlations and you know, the kind of homophily degree that is uh, produced by these different aspects of uh, our social profile, so to speak. And that's it uh, for my part. Now I leave the floor to Fabio, who will present a couple of other projects. Thank you, Paolo. Let me, I will share my screen again. Uh, so thank you very much. So now uh, I will switch the focus uh, on the other part of the lab. Why? Because as Paulo mentioned, we are producing data all the time. And sometime, based on the project that Paulo just presented, we produce data with our personal gadgets. And what the lab does, we collect this data and try to understand social phenomena or the city based on this data that we produce. So we call this the opportunistic data. Sometimes, however, we need to define and design some uh, devices to collect specific data that we need. And when we think about this overall realm of smart cities, here at the lab, sometimes we think that perhaps we are putting aside, aside parts of the city that are working pretty well for a long time and we simply ignore them. And one example is the sewage system. So for all the cities in the world where we do have sewage system, uh, since it's a century old uh, uh, infrastructure, we basically ignore when it comes to smart cities. However, with some colleagues here at MIT working in, in, in the biology field and also biotechnology, uh, we thought, mm, but we have such a rich data set that we flush every time that we go to the toilet. What if we could collect this information and make sense of public health issues based on this data? So in this case, we are not talking about sewage anymore. We're talking about data, biological data. And we know also, and we knew at the time when we started this project, uh, that cities, when they realize that they have this rich data set uh, underneath them, what they do, they try to sample wastewater, but they do uh, the sampling at the wastewater facility plants. What happens by then is that basically what we find is dirt water. So all the, the toilets flushed, they come together and they follow to the wastewater uh, treatment uh, plant. By then, you cannot trace back where this, the sewage come from and where it was generated. So basically it's dirty water. Moreover, you mix everything together when it goes through the infrastructure. So what we decide to do, we decide, mm, what if we could do two things? One is to sample this wastewater in multiple locations across the city. That's fine. However, it's a pretty dirty work as you can imagine. And then the second point was, what if we could design uh, a smarter sampling. And this is what we did uh, in this project, as you can see in this short video. Uh, so we, we first start, uh, uh, we started going there and sampling uh, the wastewater, but soon we realized, okay, let's try to design something better. So what are you gonna see now is some of our researchers coming uh, to sample wastewater. And uh, we started by, as I mentioned, uh, designing different robots. The first one was Mario. So Mario uh, could go there with six chambers and collect this, this sample samples and bring to the lab. But Mario was a little bit chubby and it, it, sometimes it was difficult to have uh, Mario go into the sewage system. Then we designed another one, a slimmer one, 
which is Luigi. And Luigi has a filter, so we don't need to bring water back to the lab, but only a filtered sewage to the lab. Uh, and then finally, we have Yoshi, which is the ugliest one, but is the most effective one. So we can keep it there with dry eyes all the time and collect samples every 20 minutes for 24 hours. Then we bring the extract to the lab. And to make sense of this data, besides the, the lab work, we also do this data visualization. And this is not fake data, this is real data. The idea behind it, as Paulo mentioned for Stockholm, is that sometimes the scientific results, they are hard to understand. And we need to have both cities and our sponsors making sense of the data in an easy way so they can implement whatever measures are necessary. So here we have this, this, this data visualization, this work done in Seoul, in Korea, uh, here in the United States, in Kuwait, and we're launching now a small project in Spain. And besides the analysis, we can have this tool that cities and companies, because this project has been sponsored by both a country, Kuwait, but also different companies. Uh, and why? Because they realize that we have this rich amount of information that we can track public health issues. So I'll give you uh, uh, how effective this, this, this topic is. For instance, when we sample at the treatment plant, basically whatever you take out of the treatment plant, uh, plant only 26% is gut bacteria. Everything else is environmental bacteria. When it comes to the, the stool, obviously we have almost 100% of gut bacteria. With our methodology, meaning we are distributing robots across the city, every time that the, the sewage uh, network connects, uh, we have the robots deployed, so we reach 63%. So it's a pretty uh, cheap way of having a much better coverage. And why this is important? So one of the, 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 the two cases that I, I tell you now how this has been working. First is that when we are doing the, the project, uh, two of our colleagues who were leading the project at the time, they, 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 they saw that they could track also uh, illicit drugs and basically opioids in general. And as we all know, in the United States, we have this uh, uh, drug epidemic. So uh, actually prescription drug epidemic. And they were able to track this. This was not the focus of the project. So they create a, a startup that is very successful called Biobot that has been doing this for uh, a few years now. And now with the COVID-19 pandemic, they are also able to uh, track uh, COVID-19 uh, through the sewage system. And they are doing this for hundreds of cities in the United States. So this also show how this type of sponsored research can then uh, become a, a business. And this connection with the market is quite important for us. And the second project is, is called Rowboat. So Rowboat, basically a few years ago, the city of Amsterdam came to us and said, okay, look, uh, KPMG says that the Netherlands is the, 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 the most, the, the better, the best prepared country uh, to deploy autonomous technologies. Uh, now it's Singapore, but until 2019, it was the Netherlands. Uh, and countries, cities, and companies are investing billions of dollars uh, in autonomous uh, mobility, right? And Amsterdam was trying to do the same. So they came to us and said, say, how could we do something on autonomous mobility in Amsterdam? And when we saw this map and we showed this map to them, say, okay, look, why would Amsterdam, where we have so many people biking every day and walking, and you have a very good transportation system, why would you put more cars, regardless if they're electric cars or autonomous cars or whatever cars, they will be clogging the streets. So why don't we go back uh, to the canals that basically uh, organize the city of Amsterdam? And we decide to deploy what we call rowboat. So, so rowboat is an autonomous boat and they, it can have multiple functions. So here you have two of the functionalities. One of them is a transport people, but other uh, is, is, is as a tugboat. So for all the tourist boats that you have in Amsterdam right now, 
they need to navigate 90 minutes daily without any passenger, simply to go to the place where they more, to the city and back. So what's the cost of that? The captain. So if we could replace the captain with a tugboat, it would decrease a lot of the price. But also, as you can see, our boat does not look like a boat. It, more, it looks like more kind of a platform. And why? Because one of the things that the boat can do is to, to latch to each other and create this sort of platforms that can become stages for concerts or this type of floating markets. As all technological projects, we start, we began with these conceptual ideas, but very soon we start doing actual uh, work and research. And we have some, some IPs derived from the project, as well as some uh, scientific papers and some technologies developed along the, the project. And here we did all the tests initially uh, here at MIT. And this is a, a quarter scale boat to give you an idea of the size is one meter by 50 centimeter. But very soon we start growing and, and, and facing all complexities of Amsterdam. So here, what we, we see uh, is how we can bring this autonomous boat to become a solution for the city. And I will show this, this example later, but uh, we said, okay, we can resume some of the functions that we have in the city. However, we need first to navigate the canals and it's pretty, pretty complex. So here we are using a combination of technologies, but finally this year, we are launching the full scale boat and it has been uh, in weekly tests in Amsterdam. So if you were in Amsterdam now, probably in, in, in the morning, we'll be there uh, doing some of the, the tests. So currently the boat is already uh, fully autonomous. And what we're working on right now is okay, now the boat is autonomous. So how can we bring the latching part to work at the full scale? As, as you can see, uh, this is another project where we have a combination of, 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 of companies and governments sponsoring this huge uh, project. And to conclude why, what the city can do with this. So the city can either change some current public services such as waste collection. So to give you an idea uh, now, in the city of Amsterdam, they have underground bins, however, they cannot implement underground bins in the city center for several reasons, including the streets are very narrow. So we don't have space to have the sidewalk, the, the road and the bin, the underground bin. But also the most important thing is that, okay, we have the trucks going there. And if I put more bins there, I would have these huge trucks going there to collect waste and the infrastructure uh, underneath the streets, they are some of them 300, 400 years old and they are wooden infrastructure. So they collapse and the city is actually investing billions of dollars to uh, rebuild part of the infrastructure. So the city is very interested in bringing part of the services, including waste collection in some parts of the city back to the canals, but also this type of uh, shuttle, let's say, uh, this is a project we call round around because this, the distance between where we are looking at this image to this building, which is the, the Museum of Science in Amsterdam, it's only 60 meters. However, currently, if you want to go from one point to the other, the shortest path is almost 100, uh, 1000 meters. So one kilometer. So bringing this autonomous shuttle would uh, improve tremendously mobility. And we have actually uh, one part of the museum where I'm here taking the picture. So this is, uh, I think, I hope that Paulo's and my uh, uh, presentations uh, could give you an overview of the different types of research that the lab has been doing with uh, governments, but also and mainly with private companies. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, uh, Paolo and Fabio. This is just so uh, tremendously fascinating. So I'm sure our audience is very excited to start asking you some questions. So to the audience, what um, if you could raise your hand by clicking either on reactions or if you're in an old version of Zoom, I believe it's under panelists, um, Jackie and I will select and unmute you to ask your question. So while I wait for that, actually, I have a question. How do you decide on your research? Or what do you take? How do you decide about what research to take on um, in your lab? Fabio or Paolo? Yeah, Paolo, why don't you go? Uh -huh. Oh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but you only have the power to give us the, the you know, the unmuting. So, sure. yeah, I was saying, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, that actually, there is a, a combination of different ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some of the projects uh, start uh, because either of opportunity or interest in a new topic. Uh, this is, for instance, the case of the Minimum Fleet uh, project where we started from this big data set that we acquire because we are int interested in understanding more the dynamic of traffic and whether we can do something to improve that. And actually, this is an example of a project that started, let's say, was self-started in the, in the lab, actually, mm -hmm. even earlier with another project that was called HubCab that was looking at sharing opportunities between taxi trips. Mm -hmm. And that was a project that generated a, a lot of interest in industry. And for instance, for some years, Uber has been a sponsor of the lab because of the project that we started by just looking at data. In other cases, some of the projects start because uh, some collaboration that we established and uh, Robot is a very good example with the city of uh, Amsterdam in which we basically discussed together with the city what could be uh, an, a next step for the city. How can we exploit you know, this combination of data and technology to do something new for the next uh, 10 years of the city? And these are more like a design-like uh, type of projects. Got and, it. Yeah, Fabio, if you want to add anything. Yes, to please. No, it's fine. Let's, thank you, Pam. Let's move on to the reference. Oh, you're ready. OK, so we do have a question from Kevin Milliken. So I will uh, unmute him. Um, I believe I've. Yes, I think you've got me. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you so much. Go ahead, Kevin. OK, uh, I was trying to turn my camera on. Uh, obviously, very, very interesting. Um, I did set a broadcast out. I happened to live in Amsterdam for three years in two different places, one on the canal and one in the Mastrat. And uh, trash and garbage is a problem. Um, and uh, just for those who haven't been to Amsterdam, if, uh, if uh, you go to a restaurant that doesn't have a cat, go eat someplace else. Um, but my, my career question really comes to transferability. Um, I've seen a lot of these uh, studies, density studies, traffic studies in New York, or in, you know, the Amsterdam circumstance would probably transfer nicely to other cities that are canal based. Um, but when I look at, I happen to live in just outside of Las Vegas now, just moved here. And when I look at some of the traffic patterns, one of the business problems for tourists right now is there's not enough transport, taxis, Ubers, Lyft. Uh, because there's been some policy around you can't have surge pricing. So it's not worth it anymore, not worth the rat risk. So when you look at, again, either, either one of those two examples or whatever else you have in your portfolio, um, what's the process um, to think about how they transfer to similar, but maybe not exactly like, e.g. Las Vegas Anderson's a big footprint, Manhattan's not as big footprint, huge density, but does that type of technology transfer? Yeah, I, I can take this, Kevin. Thank you for the question because we actually did uh, that kind of exercise in the project that I mentioned where we look at taxi data. Uh, for instance, when we look at the opportunity of uh, sharing taxi rides, so there the idea was, I mean, if I have two taxi trips with a similar origin, similar destination, can I share the rides and serve these with a single taxi instead of two? And we actually, initially we did the study in New York, but then we asked exactly the question that you were asking, to what extent are the findings 
in uh, New York that were very exciting. We basically discovered that more than 95% of, uh, of the trips could be easily shared in New York with minimal discomfort for customers. But New York is New York. And Las Vegas, as you said, is a completely different layout, much more dispersed. So we look at four other cities, uh, three other cities, San Francisco, uh, Vienna, and Singapore, and we found very similar results. So we were able to identify the relevant features of the city that we should uh, look at, that were, of course, the area of the city. And then one important was the average speed of traffic that play, uh, uh, played a, another big role. And we were able to find a formula that uh, by applying that formula, we saw that it has a very close resemblance with the data that we collected through the city to the different cities. And that would allow us to do the kind of generalization and transferability step that you were mentioning. And again, we are now looking at another aspect of this related to market fragmentation, for instance. Uh, what is the point here? The point is, uh, if you have one big fleet of taxi or Uber or whatever mobility service you want that serve the entire mobility demand of the city, you can do economy of scale, you have more density of demand and you can serve the city better. On the other hand, from the consumer perspective and from the city viewpoint is not the ideal solution because you would have a monopolistic market that is bad under many respects. So where is the right balance between uh, transportation efficiency, meaning uh, generating less pollution and less traffic, while having uh, a few players in the market, not only one big player. And we are finding interesting results that carries over to different cities by looking at these fundamental parameters that I was mentioning. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo. I actually have, uh, Philip will be asking a question in a minute, but just a little technical question. Are you using bio-inspired algorithms for optimization in some of your um, work? Uh, we have done something uh, using a genetic algorithm more for uh, the optimization of the charging infrastructure of electric vehicles yes. using data collected from cell phone. Uh, for that specific uh, line of work on uh, transportation and sharing uh, taxi trips, we, we use uh, network algorithms. So we express relationship between trips with networks and then uh, use network algorithms to solve. Awesome. Philip, please go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's difficult could to ask the question after the algorithm question uh, oh, but i'll try but i'll try anyway i was I, I, very interesting examples and very interesting viewpoints on the future of cities i would have imagined that the future of cities is actually very much in the uh, growing cities of maybe you know what's sometimes called the global south in the manilas or mumbai's or lagos or and your examples seem to be very much located in, you know, the classical city, maybe Kuwait was, a, was one exception a little bit, but then it's, you know, just the cities in, in Europe and in Europe you think, and, and the US. Do you think all of this is transferable? Uh, do you believe there are other modes of transportation, of, of innovation or things of how to think about innovation in cities or what's your viewpoint on, on these new cities which are emerging? I think, Fabio, you can mention the, the, the work also in uh, Latin America and in Brazil. Uh, I can, uh, okay, yeah, I was, yeah, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, so, yes, so thank you, Philip, for the question. Uh, I think I have two examples. One of them is a project that will be launching uh, on April 24th, because it's when the MIT Tech Review will be out. It's called Favelas 4D. Favelas is a informal settlement mm -hmm. uh, that we call favelas in Brazil. We call barrios in some countries in Latin America and shanty towns in India. Uh, but basically, the idea was the following. So uh, we, working with some local uh, agents there, we use a, a very uh, pretty cheap LiDAR scanning to scan part of the favela. And why this is important? Because when we're working with uh, airborne LiDAR or any kind of uh, airborne imagery, uh, we have many occlusion. So it's difficult to, to find the, 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 the vertical uh, information about a favela. So when they, they usually they build one house on top of the other, etc. So you cannot get a very clear um, 
image or a very clear uh, morphological analysis of this environment. And we working with them, we said, okay, well, perhaps if we go there with a relatively cheap LIDAR, we can have a pretty cheap uh, scanning of the favela and give this information back to them. And why this is important? Uh, for instance, they grow, as you mentioned, the cities uh, uh, of the future, they will be, they will look, they will look like a favela in Rio, much more than they look like New York. Uh, so, and they are, they are prone to some environmental risks such as landslides. So if we can have this baseline scanning, we can assess what are the, the, the risk areas that they should take care of. But more importantly, they don't own the land. So how can we secure land tenure to the population living there? So with this light, uh, lighter scanning, we are also assigning specific uh, areas to each uh, household, let's say, and then you can give them land tenure. So this is one example that we're trying, working with local communities to, 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 to bring this sort of technology to, as you said, the global south. But I will just give a very quick example that is behind Paulo. So you have this image called Tripedia. And, <laughs> and this image uh, is, uh, is about, okay, how can I quantify how much greenery I have in my city? at least uh, along uh, the streets. So we start developing some pretty simple, actually, uh, computer vision and machine learning algorithms that we're using only Google Street View images to quantify not only the number of trees, which is already a rich information, but also the total amount of greenery that you can have in cities. And it's true that we don't have uh, Google Street View images in India or China, for instance. However, we do have 400 cities and several cities in, in, in Latin America. So, uh, and, the, and we put the algorithm uh, uh, open source on our website. So, and we do have cities currently in Argentina and in Mexico producing this 3 on their own. So it's a way of at least trying to transfer this knowledge uh, freely. That's really, truly fascinating. Certainly the trend is really, um, you know, addressing the greening of urban spaces and, you know, having that be open source is extraordinarily valuable. Are you, um, what, how are you, you know, how are you feeling about your reach and reaching cities and uh, people to, you know, leverage your technologies? This is a question that uh, we are asking frequently. So mm -hmm. what we, we do have some groups here at MIT mm -hmm. in our same department that they have a, a close contact with communities on a daily basis. Uh, what we try to do on the other hand is try to push the boundaries of science and technology. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we know that they are mature enough and easily digestible enough to be put uh, out, uh -huh. such as Tripedia. But we know that some of our technologies need to, to, to have some group or some other lab or some company translating, let's say, this technological and scientific breakthrough yes. to, to the world. That's why we believe that's really important to work closely with uh, companies, because then we have always this, this contact with, let's say, the real world. So the companies are there talking to clients, etc. So when we are discussing and solving the problems with them, uh, we know that somehow this will help their products and their contact with the communities. So you're creating uh, quite a bit of partnerships with companies, with cities, I assume, governments. But what about citizens? Is there any component of that? I think this LIDAR, this, um, uh, this Favelas 4G is called. So oh, this yeah. LIDAR, uh, so we are doing this with them locally. It's not uh, ourselves going there with the LIDAR. So they have a local group yeah. there with the LIDAR 
doing the scanning. Yeah, that is really so wonderful. And obviously, um, everyone on the, on the call, if you have any questions, I'm looking out for your hand. But in the meantime, I do have one other question. Um, your robot is really wonderful. I actually had looked it up before, and uh, one of the reasons I came to your talks um, a couple of months ago. But how does it relate to this project, relate to the future of autonomous vehicles? You're mute. <laughs> yeah, so no, I, I, I mute myself. That's to good. Not disturbing the, okay, so uh, about autonomous acts. Okay, I think this is a very important question, and why? Because one thing that uh, disturbs me a lot when we talk about autonomous vehicles is that most of the projects about autonomous mobility is simply to replace a driver with a, a robot. And it's almost as we did uh, more than 100 years ago, when we simply replace the horse with an engine. What's the point of that? It's, it, it's dumb. Uh, this is no innovation at all. So I think uh, if we want to transform mobility through these new technologies, we need to think the, the, the whole mobility spectrum, including our infrastructures. So for instance, Amsterdam, as Kevin was mentioning, he lives there for three years. So uh, Amsterdam, they have this beautiful uh, canal infrastructure that basically it now is only a tourist attraction. And less than end, when we visit Amsterdam, we say, oh, they have so many canals, right? Wrong. They have only 50% of the canals that used to exist there 100 years ago. They paved almost half of the canals to, to uh, either widen the roads or build new roads. So this is crazy. So how we can use autonomous mobility, not only to replace a driver, but to rethink mobility in the cities. If you don't mind me asking one follow-up question on this, I mean, how are you thinking about sea level rise? You know, we're in Boston, you know, people are still building in many cities on the coast, along the coastline. Where can you help us or help cities? Yeah. So we cannot say much yet because uh, Jackie can uh, contribute here, but we are launching an initiative uh, with the, the uh, World Bank actually called Land water and air mm. and we we launched very recently and now we are having uh, companies joining this initiative yeah. and one of the goals is to tackle actually this issue how can we use uh, a data driven uh, and a technology based uh, approach to first to, to understand and try to, to bring uh, creative solutions because I think one thing that I'd like to highlight in this point, is uh, what Paulo mentioned in, in his presentation at the very beginning is that the lab has this scientific and technological approach, but then how we, we can be agents of transformation. So this and this part comes design. So how can we, we, we leverage all this scientific knowledge that we can build about the cities, but then come up with some solutions? Uh, so we, we don't believe in solutions that are not based in science, but we also don't believe in science that stops at the paper level. Yes, yes. I do have someone else, I believe, who's asking. Let me, um, Peter? I hope it's, um, my click is not quite working. Peter, I guess not. Jackie, can you help me, please? Yeah, please. I'll see if I can unclick, let's see. Yes, yeah, frozen. But just to build on Fabio's point, and I think this is something that's always interesting for people to hear who haven't heard of our labs before, our lab before, yeah. is that we're actually 100% funded externally. So we have uh, cities, governments, and companies that work with us through either our consortium or through our private sponsorship, like the Robot Project. The World Bank Initiative that Fabio mentioned is very new. And the goal of that is actually to be able to have companies and cities that may not have normally had enough funding to join our regular consortium, gather together and work together on this problem that is a worldwide problem so that we can look at something, you know, to Philip's earlier point, you know, a lot of our examples have been, you know, kind of north 
of the hemisphere, right, of the, of the equator. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things that how can we get this to be brought to other places around the world? And through this land, water, air initiative, that is one of the things that we're going to try to be doing is to bring that research to these areas. And, but again, since we are to be funded externally, how can these uh, sponsors come to us, you know, in a different way through, through a potentially lower price model? Are you connected in with the SDGs, the Sustainability Development Goals at United Nations? Is it, you know, obviously everybody is, but just curious. No, it's, it's the World Bank. And if, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you just have to pause for one moment because my daughter has to get in the front yeah, door. Yeah, sure, sure. Just give me one. So, so maybe Paolo, if you could share a bit uh, more, um, would be wonderful around some of your other initiatives coming up. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I think, um, you know, uh, one project that, for instance, I want to share another project that is uh, an example of something that we started from the lab and gained a lot of traction and attracted a lot of interest from uh, sponsors is a project that we call Good Vibrations, uh -huh. in which we look at opportunities of using uh, very cheap data, so to speak, so mm -hmm. data that can be acquired uh, just from what we have, which is data from smartphones when you're driving. And when you pass over a bridge, whether you can just record the accelerometer information that your uh, cell phone in any case uh, is, uh, is recording and whether we can use uh, this sort of crowd sensing platform to derive some minimal, meaningful information about bridges. Why bridges? The reason is quite obvious. Bridges are expensive. They have a long time span. They are critical infrastructure. Think about how many problems a closed bridge uh, causes in a city, huge. Sometimes kill people, unfortunately. I'm Italian and in Italy, a couple of years ago, there was a collapse of a highway bridge who killed more than 40 people. So, you know, and currently, uh, they are very, on the technological level, they are very low. Most of the bridges are old. We know very little of their structural uh, health uh, status. Uh, only few bridges, the newer one and the most iconic one, have some sensor that actually collect data continuously. Otherwise, there are visual inspections every couple of years or something like that. But remember that when you are able to see something, it means that the problem is very big. You have a crack. Basically, you see a crack in the bridge. It is a major structural problem. And what you have started discovering, initially doing experiments by, you know, you have seen actually in the very first part of my presentation, there was one picture of uh, some of our postdocs installing some uh, sensor on Harvard Bridge. And actually is right after, uh, um, out of uh, massive uh, entrance of MIT. And initially we start driving around with cars uh, with our cell phone on the dashboard basically and try to see whether we can see any relationship between the data of the sensor that we install on the bridge itself and the data collected by the smartphone. The experiments were good. And then the next step, we flew a couple of our postdocs to Golden Gate in San Francisco to do 100 drives over there in a couple of days. That was for them not very exciting, but Golden Gate has been a bridge that has been very well studied. So we had a lot of information about the bridge and we can use a comparison. The next step was Uber, believe it or not, became interested in that after initially coming to the lab to work on, on uh, you know, sharing mobility trips that got interested in how they can harness the data that they collect anyhow to do something good for the city they're working in. And you know, this was an excellent, excellent opportunity for them. And we were able to show that even uh, spurious data collected through Uber uh, cars could be used to derive some meaningful information about bridges. And now this project has grown even further we are working with the Italian National uh, Road Authority, basically, and we have developed an app that is now installed in the, in the smartphones of the employees of this company. And by the drive around, we have done a, a little piece of software that when you are on a bridge, you record data, you download it on the server. And we have started doing this in a, a few highway bridges surrounding Rome. And, you know, it's becoming a real thing. And, you know, the Italian National uh, uh, Road Authority is really interested in, in making this a technology that they would use 
for maintenance of the 17,000 bridges that they are monitoring all over Italy. I mean, uh, we obviously know that here in the US, we've got some serious infrastructure problems, right? Yes. That bridges is just a huge one. It's so fascinating. Um, I, I was thinking just, and if this could be Jackie or you or um, Fabio, is how has the pandemic changed uh, your thinking around your research or even your direction of your research, if at all? But I'm just curious, because we're at the symposium where we're talking about this big reset, right? And so what does that mean for you? Do you want to take on the data that we did with the emails at MIT post-pandemic? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, uh, to, to, to go, go back to your question, we are actually doing this kind of self-critical discussion at several layers, right? One is how it has impacted our own life as a lab. Our own opportunity has been funded as a lab because as uh, Jackie has mentioned, uh, you know, we are basically 100% funded by external sources and we are also very worried. But we also made this into a research project because we are researchers. And for instance, we have collected and we are still collecting a lot of data from MIT campus about how we exchange email between each other. So also the mail exchange that we just have probably will be in our data sets are fully anonymized, don't worry. Uh, and only the fact that there has been an email exchange between a couple of people at MIT, but we are able to, we actually started collecting the data in December, 2019. So right before the pandemic, and we are still collecting data and we are analyzing what are the changes that we are observing in these big experiments that has been, uh, you know, transitioning from everybody going to MIT to everybody working from home and back to a mix of the situation. Now, some of the professors go, all the students are there and we are working hard on, uh, you know, understanding how these has changed our interactions, the way in which we interact through email and how we can use this information to better resume uh, uh, working after the pandemic, because we definitely want to resume some type of in-person interaction. On the other hand, we know that we have seen already, you know, there has been uh, papers showing the good, in a sense, impact of pandemic on the, the, the climate, because, you know, the level of emissions in cities has been reduced a lot. So can we, take the benefit of both, so to speak. And you know the data that we have collected and we are analyzing could be a good way of uh, looking into that. Wonderful. We have just a couple more minutes. And I wonder, unless someone has any other question, I wonder if you could share you know, to this wonderful group of um, CIOs and technologists, um, what key takeaways you would like them to bring with them that they could, you know, incorporate or connect with you, et cetera. And of course, Jackie can speak uh, certainly right after, but if, if you could just speak a couple of words ar around that, that would be awesome. And then I'm just going to interject for one minute, Paolo, if you could take that, because Fabio uh, actually has a, a call with one of, we're doing a, a, a presentation of Viennale uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. So he has a call for that at three. So I know he just wanted to say thank you and bye really quickly. So, so let's thank you both so much. We were delighted Sorry, no, no, no. to have you and we would be pleased if we can wrap up with Paolo and we're looking forward to hearing more from you and everyone can connect with you via our uh, community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, uh, uh, what I can say, uh, also building on my personal experience, I have a background in computer science and I always looked at technology, mostly looking at the technical problems and solving technical problems. But when uh, you work and you want to make an impact, there are basically people in the decision-making process, people who hopefully eventually will use the technology that you have uh, designed or produced. And uh, so in a sense, uh, we should be able everybody to look uh, at cities as really complex organism where we can definitely do any good cities using technology. And that's, you know, as a lab, as I say, our mission. On the other end, we should really keep reflecting on, first of all, involving communities. That is some fundamental importance because for instance, many initiatives in the smart city areas uh, have had this 
very strict top-down technological approach where you go in a city, you install tons of sensors, you collect data and you see, oh, this is your smart city solution without even asking what people is, is caring for, whether, you know, that is there anything useful to be done for the community where installing your technology. And but there has been many not successful experience in, the, in, this, in this range. And so I think, you know, looking at the more uh, nuanced approach where you look not only at the technological aspect, but also the, the community, the design, uh, you know, the interaction with people, with stakeholders to really understand what are the problems, uh, what are the obstacles towards improving a certain process that are necessarily not only technological, I think is a, is a very useful thing that we are trying to do at the lab. Wonderful. I'm, I really love uh, that um, connection to real people, real communities, and really solving problems on the ground that I think we all collectively have to tackle at all scales. So, um, Paola, I just want to thank you and obviously thank Jackie thank and Fabio for a, a wonderful uh, presentation. And we will be just delighted to hopefully continue the conversation. We hope you can join our community and engage with some of our CEOs too. Um, and look forward to um, look forward to speaking with you and Jackie and others coming up. So thank you and thanks everyone who joined our call today. Thank you. Thank bye. you so much. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.